So folks, and thank you for joining me for another reading on the Freemasonic channel and today's reading will be Freemasonry and the Druids by W. Winford Reed. There is a divine and hidden science whose origin can only be discovered by the wavering lights of tradition whose doctrines and purposes are enveloped in sacred mysteries. It is now degenerated into a society of gluttons and wine-bibbers who yawn while their masters expound to them those emblems which have excited the wonder of the greatest philosophers of the past, and who deem that the richest gem of Freemasonry is the banquet which closes the labor of the Lodge. And yet this order can boast of some learned and intellectual men who endeavor to find the key to the hidden language of symbols and who appreciate at its true value the high honors which the initiated are permitted to enjoy. In spite of the abuses which, with which it has been degraded, in spite of the sneers with which the ignorant re revile it, this institution still possesses much that is holy and sublime. No feelings can be compared with those which young man feels when, attired in strange array, blindfolded, the dagger pointed to his naked left breast, he is led through the mystic labyrinth, whose intricate ways are emblematical of a toilsome wanderings of his soul. The strains of solemn music, the mysterious words, the low knock at the portal, the sudden blaze of light, and the strange sight which await his eyes, feeble and fluttering from their long imprisonment. What awe he feels as kneeling on his right knee, his left hand placed upon the book of law, encircled by the masters in their robes of office, and to the white, white wands held over his head in the form of a cross, he takes the oath of secrecy and faith to hail, conceal, and never reveal the hidden mysteries of the fellowship to which he is now admitted. And what pride flushes in his heart when the secret signs and the key words are imparted to him, and when the white apron, a badge more glorious than the fabled golden fleece or the Roman eagle, is tied around his waist. Surrounded by all those signs and symbols by which the ancient nations were wont to express the power and presence of God, the Mason's Lodge resembles a scene of enchantment in the midst of this wilderness which we call the world. And those who are thus assembled together in mystic robes seem spirits of another age who have returned to hold their hidden meetings once more in the catacombs of the Egyptian pyramids or in the cavern temple sacred to Mithra or in the subterranean labyrinths of the holy druids. The brethren seated in a circle, one of the masters arises and advances it to the midst. He relates to them a tradition of origin of, of the origin of their craft. After the sun has descended down the seventh age from Adam before the flood of Noah, there was born unto Methusiel, the son of Mehudia, a man called Lamech, or Lamech, who took unto himself two wives. The name of one was Ada and the other Zila. And now Ada, his first wife, bare two sons, one named Jabel and the other Jubal. Jabel was the inventor of geometry and the first who built houses of stone and timber, and Jubal was the inventor of music and harmony. Zila, his second wife, bare Tubal Cain, the instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and a daughter named Nama, who was the founder of the weaver's craft. All these had acknowledged from above that the Almighty would take vengeance for its sin either by fire or by water, so great was the wickedness of the world. So they reasoned amongst themselves how they might preserve the knowledge of the sciences which they had found. And Jabal said that there were two different kinds of stone of such virtue that one would not burn and the other would not sink. The one called marble and the other latris. They then agreed to write all the science that they had found upon these stones. 
After the destruction of the world, these two pillars were discovered by Hermes, the son of Shem. Then the craft of masonry began to flourish, and Nimrod was one of the earliest patrons of the art. Abraham, the son of Jera, was skilled in the seven sciences and taught the Egyptians the science of grammar. Euclid was his pupil and instructed them in the art of making mighty walls and ditches to preserve their houses from the inundations of the Nile, and by geometry measured out the land and divided it into partisans so that each man might ascertain his own property. And he it was who gave masonry the name of geometry. In his days it came to pass that the sovereign and lords of the realm had gotten many sons unlawfully by other men's wives, insomuch that the land was grievously burdened with them. A council was called, but no reasonable remedy was proposed. The king then ordered a proclamation to be made throughout his realms that high rewards would be given to any man who would devise a proper method for maintaining the children. You could dispel the difficulty. He thus addressed the king, My noble sovereign, if I may have order and government of these lords' sons, I will teach them the seven liberal sciences, whereby they may live honestly like gentlemen, provided that you will grant me power over them by virtue of your royal commission. This request was immediately complied with, and Euclid established a lodge of masons. This tale is curious as being the earliest account of an educational institution. There are various traditions of minor interest relating to the patriarchal, patriarchal ages and to the wanderings of the Israelites in the wilderness. The Freemasons claim descent from that body of builders who, from Phoenicia and some from India, came to Jerusalem to erect the Temple of Solomon. They also assert that these Masons were governed by the same laws and united by the same ties as those of the modern order and in the initiation of the Master Mason, the following tradition is related respecting the death of the Phoenician Harem, Harem Abiff, the master architect who directed the building of the temple. There were fifteen fellow craftsmen who, finding that the temple was almost finished, that they had not received the master's word because their time was not come, agreed to extort it from their master, the skillful Harem Abiff, on the first opportunity that they may pass four masters in other countries and have master's wages, twelve recanted that the other three determined to carry out the plot. Oh, twelve recanted and the other three determined to carry out the plot. Their names were Jubila, Jubello, and Jubilum, Jubilum, <laughs> Jubilum sorry. And these three crafts, knowing that it was always the master's custom at twelve at noon, when the men were called off to refreshment, to go into the sanctum sanctorum, to pray to the true, live, true and living God, they placed themselves at the three entrances to the temple, viz., at the west, south, and east doors. There was no entrance in the north, because hence, thence the sun darts no rays. Thus they waited while they made his prayer to the Lord, to have the word or grip as he came out, or his life. So Hiram came to the east door, and Jubila demanded the master's word. Hiram told him he did not receive it in such a manner, but he must wait. And time, and a little patience, would bring him to it. For it was not in his power to deliver it, except the three grand masters were together, viz. Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Hiram Abiff. Jub Jubila struck him across the throat with a twenty-four inch gauge. He fled hence to the south door, where he was accosted in the same manner by Jubello, to whom he gave a similar answer, and who gave him a blow with a square upon his left breast. Hiram reeled, but recovered himself, and flew to the west door, where Jubilum gave him a heavy blow upon the head with a common gavel or setting maul, which proved his death. After this they carried him out of the west door, and hid him in a heap of rubbish till it was twelve at night, when they found means to bury him in a handsome grave six feet east and west and six feet in height. 
When Hiram was missed, King Solomon made great inquiry after him, and not hearing anything of him, supposed him to be dead. The twelve crafts that had recanted, hearing the said report, and their consciences prickling them, went and informed King Solomon with the white aprons and gloves as tokens of their innocence. King Solomon forthwith sent them in search of the three murderers who had absconded, and they agreed to make the pursuit in four parties, three going north, three south, and three east, and three west. As one of these parties traveled down to the Sea of Joppa, one of them, sitting himself down to rest by the side of a rock, heard the following lamentations proceeded from a cleft within. Oh, that I had my throat cut across and my tongue torn out by the root, and buried in the sands of the sea at low water a cable length from the shore, where the tide doth regularly ebb and flow twice in the course of a twenty-four hours, then that I had been concerned in the death of our master here. And then another voice. Oh, that I, my heart torn from under my naked left breast, and given to the vultures of air as prey, rather than... I had been concerned in the death of so good a master. But, oh, cried Jubilum, I struck him harder than you both, for I killed him. Oh, that I had had my body severed in two, one part carried to the south and the other to the north, my bowels burnt to ashes and scattered before the four winds of the earth, rather than I had been concerned in the death of our master Hiram. The brother that heard these sorrowful lamentations hailed the other two, and they went into the cleft of the rock, and took them, and bound them, and brought them before King Solomon. When they owned what had passed, and what they had done, and did not deserve to live, therefore King Solomon ordered their own sentences to be executed upon them, saying, They have signed their own deaths, and let it be upon them as they have said. Jubila was taken out, and his throat cut across, and his tongue torn out by the root, and buried in the sands of the sea by the low water, and the cable length from the shore, where the tide did regularly ebb and flow twice in the course of twenty-four hours. Jubilo's heart was torn from under his naked left breast, and was given to the vultures of air as prey. And Jubilum's body was severed in two, and one part carried to the north, the other to the south. His bowels were burnt to ashes, and scattered to the four winds of the earth. After this, they carried him out of the west door and hid him in a heat of rubbish until it was twelve at night, when they found means to bury him in a handsome grave six feet east and west and six in height. When Hiram was missed, King Solomon made great inquiry after him. Whoa, what just happened? Hold on, we got a repeat here. We got a repeat, so we're going to just scan ahead. Oh, my heart torn from there the brother they saw it repeats the whole thing twice somebody did a double copy so let's go down here to where we should be and it's Jubilum body was severed in two and earth and so this i need not remind the reader is a story very similar to those current respecting the first planting of druidism in britain okay uh and and this should be pertinent in this time and age since i do believe in and I usually reserve comments, but I do believe just a year or two ago, Druidism was uh, reestablished as a uh, lawful and respectable uh, religion in the UK. Look it up. So, I will continue. As also discovered, as I thought, a key to the tradition of Hiram Abiff, which I have just related, viz. that it was simply the story of Osiris, killed by Typhon, the even spirit, evil spirit buried in a coffin and found by Isis, so corrupted by modern masons. In the continuation of the story of Hiram, it is stated that the twelve crafts on discovering his body were unable to raise it, and that King Solomon ordered a lodge of master masons to be summoned and said, I will go myself in person and try to raise the body by the master's grip or the lion's paw. By means of this grip, the Grand Master Hiram was raised. By the means of this script, the Grand Master Hiram was raised. Now, in a figure painted on a mummy at the Austin Friars of La Place des Victors, representing the death and resurrection of Osiris, is seen an exact model of the position of the Master Mason as he raises Hiram. Jubila 
jubello and jubilum are merely variations from the Latin word jubio. I command and the uh, pretended assassins are represented as demanding the master's grip and word from Hiram in an imperious manner. And yes, uh, King Solomon was a sorcerer. He is the one who made the seals and uh, so forth. So we'll, we'll get more into him in other books, I'm sure, if you didn't already know that. So, go to continue. A more satisfactory proof of the truth of this statement is contained in astronomical notions of the Hindus, whose Krishna, Krishna is the same as the Osiris of the Egyptians. The Deacons, or Elohim, are the gods of whom it is said the Almighty created the universe. They arranged the order of the zodiac. The Elohim of the summer were gods of benevolent disposition. They made the days long and loaded the sun's head with topaz, while the three wretches, wretches that presided in the winter at the extreme end of the year hid in the realms below were, the with the constellation to which they belonged, cut off from the rest of the zodiac, and, as they were missing, were consequently accused of bringing Krishna into those troubles which the, at last ended in his death. Even allowing these premises to be true, it does not necessarily follow that the traditionary account of the building of Solomon's temple by Masons was also allegorical. And indeed, there is so much that is purely Hebrew in ceremonial masonry that one is almost forced to believe that the Freemasons of the present day are really descended from a body of architects who, like the Dionysiacs, of Asia Minor were united into a fraternal association who erected the Temple of Solomon. In these ceremonies, however, and in their emblems, there is much also that is Druidic, and if Freemasonry did not emanate from Druidism, there can be no doubt that it sprang from the same origin. I will trace out the, diff uh, oh, I will trace out the affinity between the Masonic order of the present and the Druid order of the past. It shall be for the reader to decide whether these Masonic usages are vestiges of Druidism or mere points of family re resemblance. The initiations of Masons are so similar to those of the Druids that any Mason reading my article upon the subject must have been struck by the resemblance. Most Masons don't know anything about Druids. The Ovid wore a gold chain round his neck, and the apprentice, when initiated, has a silk cord. In Masonic parlance, a cable toe suspended from his throat, like the Ovid, the apprentice is blindfolded, and the former was led through the mazes of the labyrinth, and the latter is led backwards and forwards and in various directions. Thunder and lightning were counterfeited in the initiation of a druid and in that of the royal arch, and companions fire pistols, clash swords, overturn chairs, roll cannons across, cannonballs across the floor. The tiler stands at the door with a drawn sword. Uh, they, they create a, like chaos and, and distraction for you there. Uh, the test of fortitude, uh, though less severe, than in former times are not unknown among masons. The following arduous trial was used in the female lodges of Paris. A candidate for admission was usually very much excited. During a part of the ceremony she was conducted to an eminence and told to look down at what awaited her if she faltered in her duty. Beneath her appeared a frightful abyss in which a double row of iron spikes were visible. No doubt her mind was in chaos, a chaos of fanaticism, for instead of shrinking at the sight, she exclaimed, I can encounter all, and sprang forward. At that moment, a secret spring was touched, and the candidate fell not on the spikes, but on a green bed in imitation of a verdant plain. She fainted, but was soon recovered by her friends. Then, when the scene having changed, she was reanimated and soothed by the sweet strains of choral music. I have already shown, I trust conclusively, that the Druidic mysteries were founded on those of the Egyptians, and were analogous to those of Tyre, per Persia, and Hindostan, and that their moral doctrines and pristine simplicity of worship were those of Hebrew patriarchs. 
it will be easily oh it will be easy to show that those free those of freemasonry if not a mere per perpetuation of the juridic were derived from the same fountains and that the secrets of this science and philosophy are hidden from us by the veil of isis <laughs> to the egyptian candidate on his initiation the hierophant displayed the holy volume of hieroglyphics which he then restored to its repository so when the eyes of the apprentice are first released from darkness he beholds the volume of the sacred law during the persian initiations the doctrine was enforced ex cathedra from the desk or pulpit so the grand master sits on a throne before which the candidate kneels pointing a dagger to his naked left breast and two white wands being crossed above his head on the seal of the ancient abbey of arbroth in scotland is a representation which bears a curious resemblance to the engraving on a seal used by the priests of isis and which plutarch describes uh, plutarch as describes as his essay on isis and osiris a man kneeling his hands bound and a knife at his throat in all the ancient mysteries before the aspirant could claim participation in the higher secrets of the institution he was placed within the pastos or bed or coffin and was subje subjected to a confinement in darkness for a certain time <coughs> excuse me this i have described to be practiced by the druids in some of their labyrinths discovered in france the remains of cells have been found there was a dark cell of probation recently standing near Mad maidstone kit's cotty house from ked or Sir siridin or siridwin the british isis and cody an ark or chest or cotty an ark or chest so in the initiation of a master mason the candidate is in some lodges buried in a coffin to represent the death of the murdered Hiram Abiff. Let me say that again. So in the initiation of a master mason the coffin is representative of the death of the murdered Hiram Abiff. Okay, the Grand Festival of Masonry is on Midsummer Day, which is also the Grand Festival of the Druids. The processional movements of the Masons as of the Druids were mostly circular. Uh, if anybody saw the ceremony at the Ground Zero and their circular, which created the eye, you know, uh, which you get the overall view, you can look it up on YouTube. There's a video of it. There's a few videos with clips of it in it, too. I have already instanced the symbol by which the Jews expressed the word Jehovah. This letter, Jod, was believed by them to denote the presence of God, especially when conveyed in a circle. Masons also have a word which they are not allowed to pronounce except in the presence of a full lodge, and they pay peculiar reverence to a point within a circle. Some of the Juretic monuments are simple circles with the stone standing in the midst, and the boss in the center of their circular shields has probably the same signification. Uh, the Masonic Lodge, like all pagan temples, is built due east and west. Its form is an oblong square which the ancients believed to be the shape of the world. In the west are two pillars surmounted by globes. The one on the left is called Boaz, and the supposed represent Osiris, or the sun, and the other, Jachin, uh, the emblem of Isis, or the moon. And the floor is the mosaic, of course, and the walls are adorned with the various symbols of the craft. Uh, the cross is one of the chief emblems in masonry, as it is, as it was in Druidism, and in all other pagan religions. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, sorry about that. It choked up on that. Anyway, <laughs> the tall is a badge in royal arts masonry, and almost all other varieties of the symbol are used in masonry. A key and the cross keys are also mosaic symbols, and they are supposed to be ast astronomical signs of Anubis or the Dog Star. Um, and the ear of corn is a prominent emblem in masonry, pr proving that the order did not confine their intellects and their labors to the building of houses, but devoted themselves also to agriculture. Everybody say Monsanto.
Okay. A sprig of acacia is one of the emblems revered by the Masons and answers to the Egyptian lotus for the myrtle of Eleusis and the golden branch of Virgil and to the druidic mistletoe. It is curious that Huaza, in which Mahomet esteemed an idol, Huaza, uh, who so honored the Arabian works of Gaftan Koresh and Kenna and Salem, should be simply the acacia, or acacia, yeah, acacia. Uh, thence was derived the word Huza in our language, which is probably at first a religious exclama exclamation like Yehove uh, of the Bacates, 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 Bac uh, oh, forget it. Okay, the doctrines of masonry are the most beautiful that it is possible to conceive. They breathe the simplicity of the earliest ages, animated by the love of the martyr of a martyred god. The that word which the Puritans translated charity, but which was really love. Love is the keystone of the royal arch upon which is supported the entire system of this mystic science. In the lectures of the French lodges, the whole duty of a mason is summed up in this one brief sentence. Amen. Oh my goodness. Amos vous les uns les astres instressives securis viola to nor liver to nor loi to le nor science. I, I think that's French, and I'm terrible at French. But I, you know. Anyway, uh, love one another, teach one another, help one another. That is all our doctrine, all our science, and all our law, is what that says in English. So, uh, hail, ah, uh, rail against us, bigoted and inger ignorant men, slander us, curious and jealous women, if you will, those who obey the precepts of their masters and those who listen to the truths which they inculcate can readily forgive you. It is impossible to be a good mason without being a good man. We have no narrow-minded prejudice. We do not debar from our society this sect or that sect. It is sufficient for us that a man worships God no matter under what name or in what manner, and we admit him. Christians, Jew, Mahometans, Buddhists are enrolled among us, and it is in the Mason's Lodge alone that they can kneel down together without feeling hatred, without professing contempt against their brother worshippers. Okay, and as you notice, okay, we're gonna. That's and that's the end of this reading. There's no more to this. Um, he rounds it up real quickly there, and and basically in the last two, uh, you know, this last page worth of words here, kind of just does a complete 180 compared to what the rest of this thing is talking about, and the rest of this thing compares the Druidic and the Mason and points out that it's all based off of the pagan religions that came out of uh, pagan beliefs and stuff connected to ancient Egypt which are then of course connected to Sumeria and go back you know that's that's up to your own research you want to get that far into it but I'm not going to get into that here but the point is I I don't know why they turn this around like that but I hope you enjoyed this reading and um, uh, recognize the connections within that the author has drawn uh, and that's it that's it for this uh, I believe it would be the 14th reading and I thank you for joining me